as I said, we were going to start talking about mentorship. Um, and God really put on my heart over this last week or so um, about something else. And so the title of my sermon today is Tomorrow Will Be Better or Lessons You Can Learn at a Funeral. As I said, I was planning on talking about mentorship. And as you know, recently our family suffered a loss. My father-in-law, Tom, passed away. And it was something that we saw coming for years. He had six years of this being diagnosed, which was better than the six months he was originally given. Uh, but it didn't make it any easier. Uh, the shock and finality of death is always the same, regardless if it's a long uh, expected or if it's sudden loss. What struck me, though, was the last words he said to Tracy before leaving on that last night. He looked at her and said, tomorrow will be better. And then that night he passed away painlessly, and you know, he closed his eyes in this world, and we know he opened them up in heaven. And as believers, we've known this as the truth. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 6 to 8, so we also are confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. For we live by believing and not by seeing. I love the ESV version. It says, for we live by faith and not by sight, which is my mom's Bible verse. And my mom can't see. And so she always clung to that verse. <clears throat> yes, we are confident. And we would rather be away from these earthly bodies for then we will be with, at home with the Lord. And even though as Christians we know this to be true, sometimes because of the rush of the moment, the pressures all around us in this world, sometimes this, these words lose their impact to us. It's a truth that is a result of faith, not because of something we see. Not only should we know this to be true, in fact, we should look forward to a time Remember what Paul wrote in Philippians. Oh, let's go to it. I don't want to hear Bible pages flipping. Philippians 1. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Philippians 1, verses 21 to 24. Remember, Paul was writing from prison to this little church in Philippi. And he says, for me, for to me, Living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I am torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which is far better for me, but for your sakes it is better that I continue to live. And so the more I thought about Tom's last words, the more I was really felt led to speak on them. Death and funeral services. Anyone here ever look forward to a funeral? Anyone, you know? Um, no one ever looks forward to it. No one puts it on their schedule and says, oh, look at this, this is put little stars on it. We put it off as much as possible. Thinking about the time, you know, when, when it'll be our turn. You know, how many here have a will already prepared and ready to go? or made preparations for what your service will be like? And if not, why? And if you say, well, I don't want a funeral service, hopefully by the end of this message, you'll say, wait a minute, I should have one. Um, you know, people don't crash funerals like they do weddings. And we all know that unless Jesus comes back beforehand, death awaits everyone here. And it reminds me of a pastor who started out his sermon saying, Someday, every member of this church will die. And everyone sat there and they were stunned. Except for one man who sat in the back and he laughed. He says, well, good thing I'm not a member. So no one except knows when that day will be. You know, someone on death row can say, well, that day he knows. But they don't. All we know is that it will come. And we're going to look at a book that I don't think I've ever preached from, except for a famous passage that became a folk song, song in the 1960s. What? Anyone know this book? Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes yeah. Well, George wasn't in Sunday school. 
So, so let's turn to Ecclesiastes 7. Ecclesiastes 7, Solomon, who wrote this book, said, A good reputation is more valuable than costly perfume, and the day you die is better than the day you are born. Better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies, so the living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for sadness has a refining influence on us. And a wise person thinks a lot about death, while a fool thinks only of having a good time. Now Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. He got it as a gift from God. And we're going to look at four things from this passage. Number one, funerals are a place that we can learn about life and appreciate it. Funerals are where your reputation is sealed. Three, funerals are places where we are refined. And there is wisdom in thinking on death instead of focusing just on having fun. And our key verse is verse number two. Better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies. So the living should take this to heart. Solomon, this wise man, says it's better to spend your time at funerals instead of at parties. And as I said, no one looks forward to going to funerals. No one crashes a funeral or, you know, like they would a party or a wedding. No, for many, they go to a funeral because you have to. You know, I don't know what Tracy would say. Well, I do know if I said, you know, I, don't, I think I'm going to skip your dad's funeral. You know, when I came to, you know, I would find myself sitting there. So, no, people go to funerals because they have to today, not because they want to. And yet Solomon is saying it's better to go to a funeral if you want to learn and know things about life. Now, this doesn't mean that funerals should be fun and enjoyable, like a party, nor does it mean that we shouldn't cry at funerals. I've heard people say, well, I know I shouldn't cry. Why not? At Lazarus's funeral, Jesus wept. And he was going to raise him from the dead, and he knew he was, but he wept because death is the consequence of sin and disobedience. It wasn't part of God's plan. And so we can weep and cry for those who die as believers because we're going to miss him. I, I told Tracy, I said, you know, my mom gave me this old roll top desk and it was, it's beaten to the ground. Like the, all the wood is worn out. Uh, literally the straws are, are too big because they've slid so much. And my father-in-law told me he was going to work with me on it. And I went out there in my shop, and I was going to work on it, and I was going to, I, I got to call, and, oh, I can't call him. And so I, I went out, I said, I, I, I'm not going to work in my shop for a little bit, just to, because of that. Now, the other thing we're saying is, just as we're saying that funerals shouldn't be fun and enjoyable, nor are we saying that parties or having fun is bad. I like to have fun as much as anyone else. I'm looking forward to you on a picnic because we're going to be doing games and things as, and eating, so I enjoy eating too. But when people are at parties, their focus is not on the hard truths of life. It's about, well, having fun. It's about telling others their latest news filtered through their realities. Generally, at parties, you put on a happy face, right? Does anyone ever go to a party with a sad face? If you're invited to a party, oh, come on. <laughs> but, but that's not what you should do. You should come to parties to have fun. You know, it's been said that people at parties play parts. They show others what they want others to see while hiding what they don't want them to see. People at parties are there to have fun, have a good time. Death is the last thing. Anyone here ever bring up, go to a party and bring up death? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, well, the majority don't do that. In fact, we should enjoy. In fact, later on, Solomon in this very book says that we should enjoy every minute of our lives. In Ecclesiastes 11, verses 9 and 10, he writes, Young people, it's wonderful to be young. Enjoy every minute of it. 
Do everything you want to do, take it all in, but remember that you must give an account to God for everything you do. So refuse to worry and keep your body healthy, but remember that youth, with a whole life before you, is meaningless. Solomon says, yeah, enjoy life with one caveat. You're going to have to give an account to God of everything you do. And in fact, Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 12, 20, uh, 36 and 37. He says, I tell you, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. We will be asked to give an accounting for all of our idle words that we've said. And that we do so because what comes out of our mouth, where does it come from? Our hearts. So when we say, when, we, when James says, a person who can't control their tongue, their religion is worthless, it's because if you can't control your tongue, the stuff that's spouting out of your mouth is coming from a heart that's not saved. And so Jesus is saying, we're going to give an accounting. Solomon is saying, yeah, go have fun, but you're going to give an accounting. So what can we learn at a funeral? The first thing you can learn is how precious life is. A funeral forces us to look at how short our lives really are. Funerals should be a wake-up call to those attending, which causes us to remember that death is a reality and should make us appreciate what we have today all the more. And so, as the Bible says in Psalm 90, verse 12, Teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. Now, I like the ESV version better. You're probably all familiar with it. So teach us to number the days that we may get a heart of wisdom. We only have so many days. Much of people's lives are spent avoiding death and the thought of death or the fact that death will eventually come to us. And so it is going to come. Dr. Ernest Becker, who wrote the, a book, The Denial of Death, said the idea of death, the fear of it, haunts the human animal like nothing else. It is a mainstream of human activity, activity designed largely to avoid the fatality of death, to overcome it by denying in some way that it is the final destiny of men. Think of how much time people spend today avoiding death whether it's eating healthy foods, having healthy exercise, taking a bunch of pills or having surgeries, all of which are meant to delay or postpone the inevitable. But the most one, you can, most one, th one can do is delay. We all are going to die unless Jesus comes again in the meantime. So a funeral is a place where everything becomes real. As I said, barring his return, we will all be the guests of honor at some point. One day, all of our names will be listed in an obituary. My mom, every morning, used to read the obituaries. Why? She wanted to see if she died or not. That's what she told us. I think she just told, me, told us that. So a funeral is a place where we are reminded of what's important. The second thing we learn at a funeral is found at the end of verse 1. And the day you die is better than the day you were born. And I want to point out that he's not comparing the day of your birth, your birthday, or the day you were born, or, or the day of you die, and saying, see, dying is better than being born. Look at the context of that verse. The very first part says, a good reputation is more valuable than costly perfume. What Solomon is saying is saying something similar to an illustration that I've told you in the past. Everyone here is born or given two dates, the day you were born and the day you die. You have no control over the former and almost no control over the latter. But it's what you do with the dash in between those dates that really matters. It reminded me as I was uh, talking about this or uh, preparing this, back in the 80s, I know for some of you that's the dark ages, but I was working with computers and we had these things called dot matrix printers. Anyone remember dot matrix printers? They're very loud and noisy. Well, I was told to write up a paper for my boss, actually for his boss, and it was something that was a silly idea, but I did it because, you know, he's my boss's boss and I'm supposed to do it. And even though I argued and said, you know, that we shouldn't do it, I was still young and naive. I think I was like 23 or 24 at the time. 
and I was, I, I was brash. So I said, oh, I can go into word processing and keep zooming in, and I can type up a rebuttal. And so even though this guy's going to send this document out, it's going to have my rebuttal in there because, because I zoomed in and I typed in like two page or one page of, doc, of, of my argument against it and then zoomed back out again. What it looked like was a period. And so when I printed it, the printer would sit there for like 10 minutes over the period as it printed all these words. And it, it meant nothing unless you brought it up on the screen because it was just a dark period. Well, that's what that dash is like <coughs> for us. How much you can cram into that dash between the day you're born and the day you die. Um, how much you can pack into there. There's an old saying, every man has three names. One his mother and father gave him, one others call him, and one he acquires for himself. And you acquire your name by what you do with that dash. You know, on the day you were born, you were given your name. You know, at least I assume everyone here did. I was given the same name as my dad. I'm the second. My son is the third, and his son is the fourth. Um, but when I was born, it was just a name. You know, yeah, it's the same name as my dad. But no one knew back then whether or not I could live up to the standard that my dad set. And my son... I, he, I gave him the name because, frankly, my mom <laughs> made it a condition of my wife and I getting married. <laughs> and you don't say no to mom. Um, and, you know, so, you know, we gave him the name, but we didn't know if he was going to even follow the standard that I set. At your birth, your name is just a name. Besides, boy, isn't that a cute baby? Or boy, <laughs> that's some baby. Uh, you don't have a reputation when you're born. And Solomon is saying that at your funeral, that reputation, is be a good one, is better than costly perfume. Because perfume only covers up an odor. It doesn't eliminate it. And while a good reputation, though, is permanent. Of course, today, with the current culture, good reputations can be sullied long after someone dies. Um, can be destroyed by people holding different societal values. And so we all should have striven when we die to die with a good reputation. We learn at a funeral how to live well before we get there. Solomon said in Proverbs 22, 1, choose a good reputation over great riches. Being held in high esteem is better than silver or gold. Uh, I was just told recently, I was talking to a friend, and, you know, he knew someone who had a stellar reputation. And someone made an accusation against that person. And everyone who heard it laughed because they said, wait a minute, that makes absolutely no sense. And the person got more and more angry because he kept saying more and more stuff. But everyone just said, you know, we know this person's reputation. We know this person's mettle. It's been tried. Um, and so... A reputation is worth so much more than earthly treasures. It's been said that you never see a hearse towing a U-Haul trailer. Um, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6 and 7, After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into this world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. Right? Job said, naked I came into the world, naked I'm going to leave. Um, but we have a good reputation. And we see this in the Bible. Remember when Bar Mary of Bethany washed Jesus' feet with, she broke open that uh, expensive perfume and poured it on his feet and, and dried it with her hair. Remember what Jesus said about her? Remember, this is almost 2,000 years ago. In Matthew 26, 13, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. And you know what? We still do. Jesus prayed for her and, pros uh, and praised her for what she did. And it's held true. And that was her reputation that we still talk about today. That's on the good side of the spectrum. On the bad side of the spectrum, and I'm trying not to, you know, on the bad, bad side of the spectrum, 
one of the mo one of those ones who criticized Mary. Remember, some of the disciples criticized her. You know, that perfume could have been sold and the money given. Remember who one of those was? Judas Iscariot. You know, the one to remember this day as well. But he's remembered not in a good way. Primary is the one who betrayed the Son of God to death. But also, John reveals that he also stole the money from, from Jesus' ministry. And so Solomon's point is that when Judas was born, he was given a good name. Judas means praise. And he was from the tribe of Judah, which is a kingly tribe. Yet by the time Judas died, by his own hand, his name came to mean betrayer of the Savior of the world. At a funeral is where your reputation becomes final. You can't impress on others and say, well, if you come in my funeral, you've got to say only good things about me. That's not a reputation. That's probably a bribe. Um, our reputations as Christians have to stand out. Remember Jesus said in Matthew, let's go Matthew 5. Uh, hold on to Ecclesiastes, because we'll be jumping back there. Matthew 5. And as soon as you hear Matthew 5, 6, or 7, you know Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, verses 14 to 16. Our reputation to stand out. You, the idea that you can be a Christian and be anonymous in this world is an oxymoron. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So when the day may come when people will give, make claims against you, as the, my friend found out, your reputation will be one where people will say, it doesn't make sense. I, look, at, look, look at what he's doing, how he's living his life. He's a Christian. You know, and notice that Jesus, when Jesus said that, he says that when they see your good works, they don't say, oh, you know, great, Tim, you did great work, said. No, they say, they see Tim's good works, and they say, praise God, because works done by a Christian point people to heaven. In 1 Peter 3, verses 15 to 17, Peter writes, Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep the co your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Again, you shouldn't be known just as a good person or a nice person. Yes, Christians should be good and nice people. But those things that we do should bring people right back to God. Um, and it should make people recognize that we belong to Jesus. You are not your own. Christian reputations should be like a fragrance. What will your reputation smell like? at your funeral. That's an odd thing to say, isn't it? I didn't realize how odd it sounded until I started speaking it. What will your reputation sp smell like at your funeral? As believers, our reputation should be a reminder to who we belong to. Let's move over to 2 Corinthians. Right after 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 2. Verses 14 to 16. But Paul writes, But thank God he has made us his captives and continues to lead us along in God, Christ's triumphal procession. Now he uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. But this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. To those who are perishing, we are a dreadful smell of death and doom. But to those who are being saved, we are a life-giving perfume. And who is adequate for such as this task? 
What odor are you giving off today by the way that you live your life, by the way that others know you? Is it the odor of the world? Oh, yeah, that's just a nice person. Yep, that's a good person. But I, they're not perfect. Or is it the odor of impending judgment? Because remember, God doesn't send people to hell. People choose hell. As Jesus said in John 3, 18 and 19, there is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but the people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. The third thing to remember, death is no laughing matter. Ecclesiastes 7.3, sorrow is better than laughter, for sadness has a refining influence on us. Now, Solomon, again, is not saying don't laugh. I love to laugh. We all should love to laugh. I think looking some days, I think God has a great sense of humor. But the word he uses for laughter, Solomon is saying, this is a laughter of derision or scorn. People who laugh at death are generally people who are the most fearful of it. And so they try to deflect the fear of death with humor. Woody Allen said, it's not that I'm afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. I recently talked to a person, and they were so terrified of dying. They said that they would do anything in their power to die, uh, not to die. I said, well, why is that? Just asking. Was, they said, well, because death is the end of them. I said, yeah, but there's heaven and hell. Oh, no, I don't believe in those things. I believe that when I die, that's the end. And the sad thing is this person 20 years ago was a Bible-believing Christian, but over time they fell away. We should think about death and its implications. Ponder, as Ecclesiastes 7.4 tells us, a wise person thinks a lot about death, while a fool thinks only about having a good time. Again, it's okay to think about good times, but that shouldn't be the focus of your life. And in our society today, everything seems to be focused on having a good time. Um, and on the like sand, we shouldn't be preoccupied by death. It shouldn't be the only thing on our mind because, well, that's like abnormal. But we shouldn't fear death either. I know people who are so fearful of death, they can't enjoy life. And we are, we are here. We are God's children. We are his representatives. We are the light of the world. Why would anyone come to follow Christ if, if all of his followers are just like really sad all the time and, you know, burdened down with everything? Why would, we, why would anyone want to follow that? But when we think about death, it should make us appreciate this gift of life, a gift that's been given to us by God himself. And so because of that, we should do everything to bring glory to God. 1 Corinthians 10.31, so whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Notice it doesn't say for the glory of God and yourself, or the glory of God and your church. Everything we do should bring glory to God and God alone, even things like eating and drinking. And so we can learn a lot about life at a funeral, but we shouldn't dwell there. We must remember that regardless if you live 50 years or 100 years, when you compare it to eternity, something I don't think our brains are wired for, it'll seem like an eye blank. Do you remember when? No, I really don't. You know, <laughs> what are you doing with the dash that God's given you? Remember, time is fleeting. Our lives are passing by so quickly. Our lives represented in that dash should be packed of stuff bringing glory to God. What is your reputation today? Not the one you want people to believe, but what is it really? Now, that's at the funeral. And for Christians, we should have a very different view of death. A very different view than the world has. Amen? Christian funerals should be celebrations of a person's life. 
C.S. Lewis said, Christians should never say goodbye. First, it's important to remember that as believers, we should have no fear of death. We shouldn't mourn like the world mourns. Yeah, we can cry because we're going to miss a person. But it's not the end. It's not goodbye. We have to remember that death is a gateway for believers. Let's turn over to 1 Thessalonians. If you hit Timothy, you went too far. 1 Thessalonians 4. Starting in verse 13, Paul's writing, and he's saying, Now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to believers who have died so that you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring him back with him, the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with the commanding shout and the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of the call of God. First, the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. Then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. It's okay to cry and miss believers who have died, but not for the same reason that the world uh, cries for, at funerals. The world cries because they don't know what happens. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we must remember that our reputations are known here, but they're also known in heaven. Jesus said in Revelation 14, 13, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this down. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, say the Spirit, they are blessed indeed, and they will rest from their hard work, for their good deeds follow them. The deeds you do on this world, for God's sake, follow you to heaven. Praise God. Not only that, we will each give an account to God, as we saw in Romans 14. It's repeated in verses 10 to 12. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we all will stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scripture says, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will confess and give praise to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. We will give an account. Now, this is not a salvation matter because... If it was, we're covered by the blood of Christ. But this is a works matter. Our, during our dash, we are building on a foundation laid before us of the things we do. Let's flip over to the right a couple books. 1 Corinthians 3. If you hit Romans, you went one too far. Even left. left, right, it's all. No. I live with a di dysfunctional, directional dysfunctional woman. So, 1 Corinthians 3, verse, starting in verse 10. Paul's describing his ministry. He says, Because of God's grace to me, <coughs> I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. But whoever is building on the foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one that we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on the foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on a judgment day, fire will reveal that kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work is, has any value. If the work survives, then the builder will be, receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. All of our actions have consequences. So build on those built before us. And remember, Jesus is the cornerstone as well. So everything we do should line up with what Jesus says. If someone comes along and says something that goes against what God's word says, reject them. Go to God's word and say, this is, this is truth. His word is truth. It's not about our hearts. And he's saying, lay the foundation. And 
Solomon will say, lay the foundation when you're young. A foundation built on the words of Jesus. A foundation that will keep your spiritual house in order even when storms knock it down or attempt to knock it down. <coughs> I hate allergies. In Matthew 7, 24, it says, Anyone who listens to my teaching, this is Jesus speaking, and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds his house on a solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it was built on bedrock. But if you tend to ignore Jesus' words, if you want to sow in man's wisdom on the top, Jesus talks about that too in the next verse. But anyone who hears my teaching and ignores it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Jesus is the only true truth that we have. And the Bible is the only source of truth. I have met a lot of people who very honestly have a theology that's been warped. They actually believe that, well, I said a prayer when I was four years old, and so I'm saved. Well, what have you been doing since? No, nothing. I've been living my life for me. But saying a prayer, going to church, <coughs> giving some money, being good, being generous, doesn't make one a Christian. Those things mean nothing unless you are truly born again. And this is not something, this decision should not be something that we put off. Flip over to Ecclesiastes, I told you to hold on to it, Ecclesiastes 12. We need to remember God in our day-to-day -day lives. <coughs> Ecclesiastes 12, look at the first verse. Oh, starting in the first verse. Don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator. Honor him in your youth before you grow old and say, life is not pleasant anymore. Remember him before the light of the sun, moon, and stars is dim to your old eyes and rain clouds continually darken your sky. Remember him, again, remember your creator, before your legs, the guards of your house stop, start to tremble, and before your shoulders, the strong men stoop. Remember him before your teeth, your few remaining servants stop grinding, and before your eyes, the women looking through the windows see dimly. Remember him before the door to life's opportunities is closed and the sound of work fades. Now you rise in the first chirping of the birds, but then all sounds will grow faint. Describe any of us yet? Remember him before you become fearful of falling and worrying about danger in the streets, before your hair turns white like an almond tree in bloom and you drag alone along without energy like a dying grasshopper. And the kappa berries no longer inspire sexual desire. Remember him before you near the grave, your everlasting home, when the mourners will weep at your funeral. Whew. You see, it's far easier to become a believer when you're young than when you're old. Because you don't have all the aches and pains at that point. Or you haven't become comfortable in the rut that you've made for yourself. Now, before you say, but pastor, then I guess it's too late for me. I already ache literally everywhere. My hair is white, what I still have. My teeth are in a jar at night. Does that mean it's too late for someone? Not at all. Because looking at the rest of that passage, look how Solomon ends it in verse 6. Yes, remember your creator now while you are young, before the silver cord of life snaps. And the golden bowl is broken. Don't wait until the water jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley is broken at the well. For then the dust will return to the earth and the spirit will return to God the, who gave it. According to Solomon, you are still young until the silver cord of life snaps, the golden bowl is broken, the water jar is smashed, the pulley is broken. These are all euphemisms for death. You are young until you die. 
which means I'm addressing a church of young people, not just one or two young people, and you have no excuse to remember, not to remember and seek after your creator. And remember, you can't just seek at him on Sunday mornings. Jesus says we need to, or God says in Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. If I just told Tracy or talked to Tracy just for two or three hours on Sunday mornings and the rest of the time I was just living for me, number one, I'd probably die. But number two, I'd have a horrible relationship. And God wants us to have a relationship with him. The creator of everything wants to have a relationship with me, with you. And he does it through his word and through prayer. That is an amazing thing. That's why David said in the Psalms, what is man that you're mindful of him? It's like you having a relationship with an amoeba. You can't. And yet God can with us. Nor can you use your physical limitations or pain as an excuse not to serve. Remember, Paul was in a prison, Roman prison, and if that wasn't bad enough, remember, he was given something special from Satan, remember? Flippy, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 to 10. Paul writes, So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and to keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults and hardships and persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Notice Paul didn't try and put God in a box or back him into a corner. Well, God, if you take away this thorn, I'll keep writing these letters. I'll keep serving you. You know, uh, you know, I can't write these letters because, you know, you gave me that thorn in the flesh, Lord, and I just can't do it anymore. No. God spoke to him, and he accepted what God said. God is the sole source of strength. Please understand that we will not be able to go before God and say, well, I couldn't do such and such because of the physical condition that, well, God, you gave me. Claremont Bible Church will not be able to say to God, we wanted to serve you, but you never brought us more people. No. God gives us what we need, when we need it, and we need to walk in faith, literally need to live by faith. I've asked you guys to come up with some Sunday school lessons for children. I have no doubt that at some point, if you're doing this faithfully, that God will bring children into this church, if it's his will. It's all about him. Two other things that should encourage us as believers when we die. First off, we give it a new name. Let's flip over to Revelation 2.17. Isn't there a song, I've got a new name written down in glory? I know I can't sing, but it's pretty good, huh? I don't know the name of that song, but... If I, it's a new name. <laughs> new name, yeah, that makes sense. Revelation 2, 17. God, Jesus is saying, he says, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in ha heaven. And I will give to each one a white stone, and on that stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. Isn't that a great thought? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of speculation what that white stone represents. The best explanation I found was that a white stone for, by the Romans, if you won an athletic event, you got a white stone. And I think that's what they're talking about here. Because remember, the Christian walk is running a race. You won when you get to that point. Throughout his life, Paul would talk about running the race of his life. Philippians 3.14, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for, for which God, through Christ, is calling us. And when Paul finally reached his end, in 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 8, 
Remember, this is the last letter he wrote. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. The prize that is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. And on that white stone is a new name. A name that only the person who's given that stone will understand. Please understand, we don't know what that new name actually means. Farmy thinks it's a nickname. Their new names are going to be related to what we did here, a heavenly nickname. Remember, Jesus gave Simon a nickname, right? What was Simon's nickname? Peter. Yeah, little stone. Barnabas wasn't a, a, his real name. What was Barnabas' real name? Joseph. Barnabas means son of encouragement. What would Jesus call you as a nickname? I don't, I don't want to think about what he'd call me. But, and so I think, and as I don't know this, there's no scripture, that Jesus will use a name to sum up your life here. I, I think it's an exciting thought. You see, for a believer in Jesus Christ, tomorrow will be better. Full of opportunities to proclaim the good news to new people or to old ones that we've met. And if necessary, we'll use words to preach the gospel. Tomorrow will be better. A time to look upon God's creation. A time tomorrow will be better. It's a time where we can seek to know more about God. Tomorrow could be better because we can encourage one another warn each other as Hebrews 3.13 says you must warn each other every day that while it's still today so that no one will be deceived by the sin that har and be hardened in Christ tomorrow will be better because it could be the day that God the Father either calls us home or sends the Son of God to come get us but just as we should not dwell on death or live in a funeral we shouldn't live on the promise of tomorrow or worry about what tomorrow will bring. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 34, so don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. A very important thing about tomorrow being better. We're not promised a tomorrow. We're only given today. And so we must use today wisely. It is today where we should be encouraging each other. It is today where we should be looking for opportunities to serve and bring gl glory to God in everything that we do. Let us pray. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We like to think about tomorrow, but it's not promised. There's a lot of opportunities in tomorrow, but they may not be there. But it's today that we look. Lord, today is better. Father, I thank you for all that you've done for us. I thank you for the gift that you've given us, that eternal life and eternity with you. We thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son to die for us, for me. You say it wasn't nails that held Jesus to the cross, but his love for each one of us. And we praise you for that, Lord. And Father, I just ask that you work in us as we go about our day today. And if you give us tomorrow, we ask that we judge our time wisely and use it to your benefit and to your glory in all that we do. In your name, amen. And our closing